<clears throat> the book of Acts chapter 14, please. The book of Acts chapter 14. I don't intend to be long tonight, but I want to share just a, a truth with us um, that I hope will help, and you're going to be hearing more about this um, as we enter into the new year. In the book of Acts, we have um, several missionary journeys by the Apostle Paul, and those missionary journeys help focus us on our responsibilities to be able to share the gospel as we see what Paul was doing, what Peter was doing, what others were doing with the gospel. But there's something interesting as we come to the end of the first missionary journey. It says this in Acts chapter number 14, verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had taught many, they, what is the word? Return. Say it again. They Return. again to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch. They returned to cities that they had been at, preached the gospel to, established a, a presence of believers. And as they returned, the Bible says, verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commanded them to the Lord on whom they believed." Lord, you, you add your blessing here to the Word of God tonight. In this particular passage, I think it becomes obvious that when it says that Paul returned to where he had preached the gospel, that we learn one great basic fact right away, that Paul was a whole lot more concerned about discipling people than he was just professions of faith. That's why he's returning. As he's returning, this becomes a, a force in the New Testament. And, and the force is this, that believers, not just lost people, believers need followed up on. Believers need followed up on. Believers need encouraged. Believers need strengthened particular confirming verse 22, the souls of the disciples. Sometimes it takes larger care than what we immediately have to be able to deal with the issues that the gospel brings, although it's good issues. Do you remember in Acts chapter 6, they had to set up deacons. Why? Uh, because there was too much going on within the church and needs within the church that had to be dealt with. Um, therefore, they took that step. It's interesting, this word right here, in the beginning of verse 22, says confirming. That is used four times in the book of Acts. It's translated confirming three times and strengthening a fourth and every time that we have it used, it sets forth truth. I want to just spend a moment, if I can here, in this particular passage. Notice they returned, let's read it again in verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples. So what group is he dealing with here? Confirming the souls of the who? The disciples, confirming them who, had, who had, had made professions, and we're growing, we're coming back, we're confirming. The word confirming means this. It means to strengthen up, to shore up, to place something firmly, to lean upon, if, if you would. Um, here, the disciples needed strengthen. It, it gives us two areas. So, 
can I say what I'd like to do, even though I know it's an aspect of discipleship, and I realize that, <clears throat> but it, it's something that's really on my heart. Uh, as we start uh, the new year, I want to establish a confirming ministry, a strengthening ministry where there are those within the assembly that go and strengthen other believers. One of the most obvious needs that we have right now is I have a lot of folks, some listening tonight, that have stopped coming to services that are an intricate part of this church family simply because of age, that can't get out and be out and, and, and interact. And uh, even though we follow up, the deacons follow up, some of you follow up, it's not enough. We've got to have something more organized to be able to set up and just deal, number one, confirming a strengthening ministry, number one, with the more feeble within the assembly. Something that, that we have to do. He says right here, confirming them, and notice confirming has two parts, actually three. Number one, exhorting them to continue in the faith. Exhorting them to continue in the faith. The word exhorting is our word encouragement. It means to aid them, to help them, to comfort them. Um, it means lifting up. In other words, this is a practical, hands-on ministry, not just a verbal ministry. It's a get-involved ministry. Okay? Now, now, let me just illustrate, if I might. We have a lot of people in our church that are involved in a lot of areas of ministry. Okay? But all of those people involved in areas of ministry at times could use encouraged. Okay? Um, Brother John, a visitation, I can tell you he can use encouraged about, about what he's doing. Our deacons could use encouraged. Our trustees could use encouraged. Our Sunday school teachers, our junior church workers, those that take care of the facility, on and on and on and on the list goes. But in particular, tonight I draw attention to that group of people that are feeble among us, that are out that we never see. And it's very easy for one week and two weeks and one month and two months and three months and five months to go by. And no one has interacted with them, and yet they're a part of this assembly. Exhorting them more than just simply having a conversation. Many Christians, I believe, need strengthened. They need exhorted to continue in what? The faith. Continue in the faith. It's no small thing to walk with the Lord. Day after day after day, and a burden after burden after burden. Um, I, uh, I was just privy, can I put it that way, to a conversation that took place in the last, last month between two full-time Christian workers. Okay? One Christian worker, full-time in ministry, even though we're all Christian workers, I realize that, um, called the other. And basically um, said this, he left this on the person's cell phone. Brother, this is so-and-so. I want you to know I really appreciate you. I, I, I want you to know you're out there in the battle, and sometimes uh, you don't think anybody remembers you because you're always giving out, and nobody's ever giving back to you. Well, I, I want you to know I'm taking time today to stop and say you have a great ministry. It's really, really important um, to the Lord, and you just got to keep keeping on. That brought about the following day a response, and I wish I could, I could play the response or the words that I heard um, as these brethren were interacting. I found out about this. He said, you left that message. He said, yes. He said, I want you to know. He said, that was the bright spot of my entire day. 
uh, the fact that somebody would take time, and, and is, we're, we're, so we're all so busy, to lift up and encourage, I cannot tell you. And he went on and on and on. I cannot tell you what that meant. <clears throat> Did you notice him when I gave him that check this morning? Yes. Wow. He was really caught off guard. Do you know that? He was really surprised. <clears throat> I thought he might cry for a while. I wasn't sure. Uh, wasn't that a blessing? Um, they're up there laboring, laboring now for some years, <clears throat> trying to raise a family, do what's right. I, I was so glad that we could do that. Do you know, and you don't need to turn there, but the last verse in Psalm 110, I've mentioned this to you before, says this. Um, he found a brook in the way. And it's speaking of Jesus. He found a brook in the way. Um, there's an intensity to that that I don't know we can fully grasp, but it literally means in the humanity at least of Christ, there was something that he found that refreshed him, that encouraged him, if you would, that not only simply watered uh, him physically, but watered the, the, the spiritual part of the person of Christ. He found a broken way. Boy, I like that. Lord, help me to be a brook in the way to somebody. Lord, just help me. Take my life today, use me today, and help me to be a brook in the way. It was a place of refreshment for Christ provided for Him. A place of nourishment provided for Him. A place of joy. Something, some situation to encourage. There's a brook that the Father provided at the exact time and at the right time to bring refreshment to the Son. The result of it uh, in the end of the verse says, it will lift up the head, being the picture of somebody coming along the downtrodden and putting their hand under their chin and lifting them up, lifting their soul up, lifting their needs up. A place of refreshment, of renewed strength, revived in the midst of a mission. He will lift up the head. Boldness, encouragement, determination. Back, if you would, please, here to Acts 14. What are we saying? Let's put it together again. We're saying that there was a ministry where after Paul had preached the gospel, he came back, and at the end of his first missionary journey, he returned to several cities, and as he returned there, he ministered unto them in a stronger way, a more special way, a more life-changing way. As he did that, he uses the word confirming the souls of the disciples. By the way, we're not going to look at all of these tonight, but in the three passages, uh, four passages, three of them, one of them says confirming the brethren. The other says confirming the disciples. The other one says confirming the church. I like that. I like, I like that balance that, that we have there. Now, there's number two here. <clears throat> Not only does confirming involve exhortation, confirming involves teaching. Notice, if you would, please, the middle of verse 22. And that we, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we, would you read it with me? That we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Oh, isn't that lovely? What's happening here? Reality check is happening here. You see, he realized that some younger believers were going to get disillusioned. 
because of tribulation that began to set in to their Christian lives. And he realized that literally the disciples of Christ, those that are following him, the brother in the church, needs to be taught about tribulation. Needs to be taught in the fact that this isn't going to be a bed of roses. There's going to be tribulation. There's going to be problems. I stand back and I'm looking at that and I'm saying, okay, in today's Christian culture, the last thing you want to teach is, hey, come, we're really excited. We want to teach you about tribulation. Are you on board for that one? But Paul realized it's such a huge topic. It's such a sensitive topic. It's such a, a deep topic. He said, listen, i got to go back to basics here, and you must understand this powerful truth that you are, not, you are in Christ in the world, but in the world, just like Christ, what? You're going to suffer some persecution. He dealt with the daily grind of trial that all of us face as we serve the Lord. Praise God, He comes alongside in all of that. That's the other part here that's being taught, obviously. You see, um, I mentioned this, I don't know, months ago. I mentioned again. Uh, there are some things that can happen in our Christian life. There are some things that can happen in our Christian life that are worse than what we ever thought could happen. Aren't we saved people? Aren't we Christians? Okay, aren't we your child, Lord? Aren't we trying to honor you? I mean, aren't we trying to give? Aren't we trying to be at the church house? Aren't we trying to share the gospel? Okay, aren't we trying to walk in the old paths? Aren't we trying to do that? And then something comes along <clears throat> so devastating, so horrible, that it resets us if we're not careful. And, and it sets us back from, is this the God that I know? Would you allow me to go through that? All of us, I think, have been there or <clears throat> know people that have been there. There are some things that happen that don't take months. They take years to work out of, don't they? And what Paul was saying here, and, and, I, and I, you just see the, the leadership of the Spirit of God in this text as he's coming back. What does he do? He reaffirms. He's confirming them. He's strengthening them. He's encouraging them. And that's one of the great things he taught. You're going to have tribulation in your life. The, don't, don't, don't let that knock you out of your spiritual pocket, as it were. Those kind of things are going to happen. <coughs> Notice then verse 23. <coughs> and when they had ordained elders in every church, in number three, what does he do? He establishes leadership. He not only exhorts them, number two, he's not only teaching them, number three, he establishes leadership. Now, the great thing about that is established leadership, okay, when accepted right, is really encouraging. Why? When Paul came back and he's teaching and preaching and he establishes leadership, he established the elder position that we believe is later on, basically the pastor position. Uh, why was that encouraging? Because the people saw growth. The people saw some change. Um, the people realized, wow, this thing is moving forward. So not only was it encouraging to have leadership, it was encouraging to the people because I believe it promoted more growth. And number three, leadership helped put sideboards on the direction of the local assembly. All that comes back in principle 
that he went back to believers and the Bible says confirming them, establishing them, teaching them, establishing leadership. Then he goes a step further, notice it, verse 23, and when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord to whom they believed. Notice that, had prayed with fasting. What is the next thing he do? He establishes spiritual disciplines. He says to them, listen, here are some things that you can do to be able to help your own personal growth, the church growth, to be able to help your own surrender. And he begins to teach the principles of, of fasting and prayer here. And he begins to uh, teach principles that will help interact the tribulation that they're going to face. I, I love what I see here as he goes ahead and sets up these particular roles. And it says that he sets leadership up in churches, not just one. But, but he had a pattern as he would go back to the churches. He would confirm them. Strengthen, encourage them, exhort them. Then he would teach them. Then he would establish leadership. Then he would establish some, some spiritual disciplines. You don't need to turn there. Um, Acts 15. And Judas and Silas, being prophets, also themselves exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. Again, toward the end of the, uh, the book, uh, of, of chapter number um, 15, um, it says that Paul and Silas went, went back through the churches. He went to Syria and, and Sicily, what? Confirming the churches. Going back through and doing the same thing again. I go to Acts chapter number 18. And here it says, and went all over the country of Galatia and Perga in order, strengthening all the disciples. A strengthening ministry, a confirming ministry, brother and sister, that I think is so, so vital and so wonderful to see that take place. All right? Now, that's as far as I'm going tonight, but... Um, I felt like God was going to put here tonight who needed to hear what I was going to say. And this is what I want to put out to you. I need a few men. I need a few women. I need some couples that would be willing to say, Pastor, we can give you three hours every three months. We can give you three hours Every three months. That three hours would be one time. You're going to come, you're going to be here for three hours, and I'm going to send you one encouraging ministries to the more feeble in our church that need someone to come by, spend a little time with them. Um, I, we, we need that. Our church needs this. Um, those that used to carry the ropes and give and were involved in this assembly that are out there now, and uh, they're not able to attend the way that they were. I, I believe we really need to be on board helping here. Okay? So, Jaron, would you come? I'm going to ask Jaron to come and play quietly, and I'm going to ask you, men, women, couples, to pray over this. Could you give the church one three-hour slot every three months? If we have enough people, we can do that without any problem. Would you just bow your heads and pray with the Lord to have you to be involved there?